So you won a Grammy last night. <laughs> but you, you look like the Gamecocks just won the national championship. <laughs> uh. I was flying, you know. I just got off. I just got off a plane back back from California, and it was it was it was a it was a fun night. I got enough sleep, so I'm good to go. First question I have for you is, you know, we basically started out as co-writers. If you consider in 1987, we wrote the song George Harrison. Remember oh, that? Yes. We wrote, bad we wrote, song. <laughs> bad song. I do remember it though. And not long after, we wrote Look Away, which is on Cracked Review yep. in the 80s. Um, yep. And, and so, do you think that the fact that Hootie did so much co-writing helped you with that process when you started doing Nashville stuff? Yeah, when I went, when I went to Nashville, it was, you know, the, the, it was just so different than the way we did it. A lot of times, you know, Mark would bring me this great music and say, write some lyrics, and we'd write it. In Nashville, it was just, the really thing that got me, what, what really got me when I moved to Nashville is, is everybody co-writes. There's nobody there that writes by themselves. And I think the only person that, that I, don't, I can't think of anybody that writes by themselves. And it's all, you know, every day, like I say, they have these three sessions a day and so when I started doing that, it was easy to fit right in because we had been doing it for so long. I mean, we yeah. just we always wrote together, and you know, once once a song, once you were finished with a song, the band just all it was another writing session because we all just wrote what we felt like, you know. We would uh, sometimes we would like you mentioned uh, the other guys in Hootie. We would bring Darius just the music. Like I might have written a song, lyrics and melody and everything, but you, there was a period of time where you wanted just the music so you could come yeah. up with lyrics and melody. Do you still do that? in Nashville some, or is it sort of more traditional where it's, it's traditional. two guys in a room knocking Yeah, it out? it's traditional. We all write together now. You know, uh, he brought me the music to, to Only Want to Be With You, and he said, you know, write some lyrics to this, and I listened to it, and I didn't really dig it. And, you know, I, I, I and so I told myself I was going to write the cheesiest lyrics I could so we'd never play it. <laughs> so, honestly, and I sat down and I wrote, you know, uh, and then actually when I started writing it, I, I started liking it a little bit more, and then, you know, it was funny to me because you know that's one of our biggest hits, and I would probably be as cheesy as I can. <laughs> <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> All right, Carrie Ann, please tell us about the dynamics of writing and recording with your husband, Michael Trent, and how that sort of contributes to your style. Well, um, me and Michael had to learn to write t together. I think that we liked each other as people before we kind of got into that that stage. And I remember when we would first kind of play each other. Music, it would be kind of like shy and like, oh, like couldn't look each other in the eye and all that. And uh, but over the years, it's it's great because it's uh, uh, he's the only person that I uh, write with. Oh, I shouldn't say the only, but 99% of the music that I write is in partnership with him. I think when I was starting to write with him, there was a lot of preciousness still and ego, not ego, not in a bad way, but kind of of self attached to. The material, and at a certain point, you kind of have to let go of that so that it can take its own form, and and that was something that I had to learn because I was very much a, a solo writer. At, until does it like with does him. Uh, does your all's relationship inspire songs? Sometimes it's got to, right? I mean, you would think that it would, and sometimes when I hear a song that he writes, I worry that it has in a bad way. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's actually. Um, I think, and it must be because we spend so much time together, we don't really write about each other. And yeah. we write outside of our, of, of our personal experience more and more, definitely looking through the prism of our, our shared life out at the world and making commentary as a team. I think if, if we didn't work together so much, I might be like, Michael hurt my feelings today, <laughs> you know, off to the side, but really have <laughs> Very we cool. really do that too much. Um, <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about songwriting as a career. Okay, I'm going to talk about it from an artist standpoint, like you guys are, mm -hmm. and then also for from the, the the guys who are the girls who are just songwriters. And but starting as an artist, um, you know, you have a fan base and you have a chance to deliver a message um, and tell a story to a ton of people. Mm -hmm. How does that inspire you when you sit down to write a song? Does that ever hit you like, wow, you know, I can make it? I can make a difference with this song. A lot of people are going to hear this. Where does that, how does that hit you when you sit down? Oh, no, I never think like that. When I'm writing, I, I, I'm always just writing. I'm, I guess I'm a selfish writer, because when we're writing, I'm just writing for me. And I'm writing hoping I like the song. And if I don't, because I, you know, I, I'm the one who has to sing it. You know, and if you get lucky, you have to sing it for the rest of your life. You, you know, and my, my motto is never put a song on your record that you don't like, because if you do, you know, that'll be the hit, and you'll have to sing it for the rest <laughs> of your life. <laughs> 
And so when we sit down, most of my songs are about life, about me, about me or something that's happened. And, and, and you know, you talk about, you know, my wife, it took her a good 12 years of being with me before she realized that every song wasn't about her. Right. Uh, you know? Right. Uh, you know, it was funny. I, uh, I wrote this uh, song for my first record called uh, All I Want. And it's a big divorce song. The hook is you can have the money, you can have the house, you know, the whole divorce song. And so I took it home. And that was when she, when I realized she didn't think every song was about her, she started laughing. And then, uh, so me and the songwriter, who's my producer, we got back together and we were like, you know, I said, man, you married? He was like, yeah. I was like, have we? He was like, yeah. I was like, why? He's like, why? I was like, because you wouldn't know it from the song we just wrote, you know? And <laughs> so we decided we were going to write a song that uh, our wives would love. And that's, we sat there and wrote All Right. And that's, that's one of my biggest hits. Nice. Darius, you remember this guitar? Yes, I do. I looked at it. I was like, I think that's my guitar. <laughs> I do. I do. I looked, I looked at when, it. When uh, Darius started playing Taylor's, they were nice enough to send uh, four of these beautiful Koa. <laughs> Koa Wood mm -hmm. Taylor guitars, and uh, and Darius was then nice enough to distribute three of the four to his band members, and so I've taken very good care of it over yeah, here. Other than That's the great. time where I let Danielle Howe take it out on the road for like three years, but <laughs> it's, she did a great. She took it, care of it, it too. It exists. It still exists. It's so still doing around. great. Yeah. Um, I was writing with a guy Clay Mills one day, and uh, it was our first writing session together, and he came in, and he was in a bad mood, and he wasn't real happy, and I was like, man, you know. What's wrong with what's wrong with you? What, what, what's got you down? And he said, you know, man, my girlfriend just broke up with me. I was like, when? He's like, you know, about two weeks ago. <laughs> I was like, okay, you know, okay. And he was still down about it. And he he couldn't get over it. And I so uh, we couldn't figure about think about what to write about. And so I told him, man, you know, don't let it get you down. And I said, don't don't think I don't think about it. I, I still think about my fifth grade girlfriend, which is true. But, uh, um, and so we sat down and we decided we'd write a song called Don't Think I Don't Think About It, which was my first number one in country. I left out in a cloud of tail lights and dust. Swore I wasn't coming back, said I'd had enough. Saw you in the rear view standing, fading from my life, but I wasn't turning round. No, not this time, but don't think I don't think about it. Don't think I don't have regrets. Don't think I don't get to me. Between the work and the hurt and the whiskey, don't think I don't want about. Could have been shut up and all worked out. I know what I felt and I know what I said. But don't think I don't think about it. When we make choices, we gotta live with them. Heard you found a real good man and you married him. I wonder if sometimes I cross your mind. And where would we be today if I never drove that car away? Don't think I don't think about it. Don't think I don't have regrets. Don't think it don't get to me. Between the work and the hurt and the whiskey, don't think I don't want about. Could have been shut up and all worked out. I know what I felt and I know what I said. But don't think I don't think about it, yeah. Don't think I don't think about it now. Don't think I don't think about it. Don't think I don't have regrets. Don't think you don't get to me, no, no, no. Between the work and the hurt and the whiskey, don't think I don't want about. Could have been, should have been all worked out. I know what I felt and I know what I said. But don't think I don't think about it. Oh no. Don't think I don't. Don't you think I don't? No, 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 no.
thank you guys both for doing that. That was awesome. <laughs> that was absolutely awesome. You're awesome. Great boy. All right. So let's get a few uh, questions here. I'm going to start with my class, and we're going to start with um, Dana Walsh. This question is for both of you. How do you think that the emergence of technology and social media has impacted your music? Well, market when we started writing, you had to write everything down. So you'd be sitting in, you know, you'd be in the bathroom or something, and you had a great idea that you just loved, and you you didn't write, and you go, oh, I'm gonna write it down in an hour, and then you forget it. And the the iPhone with the voice memo has just changed songwriting for I think I think you guys would agree with that. It's just great answer. Now as soon as you have an idea, you put it on the voice memo, and you can always go back to it, and that just that's changed songwriting. I have I think 72 voice memos going Me right. Too. <laughs> yeah, it's a, you're right. That's a great that changed, answer. That, that changed everything. Yeah. Yeah, even like apps like GarageBand on an iPad. I mean, if you've got, you know, if you've got an iPad, you can demo out an entire song in the back of the van while you're going down the road. Yeah. You know? And it's not going to be, it's, and it's not good enough that you could possibly ever, like, make it be the thing. So nobody can get demo-itis about it, but it's a good working copy. That's right, and you can do the, both guitar parts mm -hmm. and the harmonies. That's and right, and be able to Whatever ideas want. you have. Um, what do you think the next step in sprucing up Charleston's local music scene is? It's, it's getting there. It's, it's taking steps to get there, but I want to know what you have, or what you all think about taking that next step to really bring it to the next level. I think a lot is, a lot's going on from, you know, the, uh, you know, Eddie's place out in Arndal and, and the music Arndal farm Green, is still, yeah. Arndal Green and the music still, I think it's just growing, the Charleston scene's growing so much. I mean, we took a step back after, it seems like we took a step back after the 90s because when we were playing clubs, you know, there was clubs in every every town you could go to. We used to play the same clubs every six weeks, and you know, we made a real good living at that before we ever had a record deal. And now, you know, it's just it's hard to find a, it's hard to find places to play. The bands always say to me, it's hard to find places to play. But I think clubs is that's the that's the main thing. I think we need we still we need those live music venues, those live music clubs where you can put two or three hundred people in there, and, and you know, really get your chops and get get a following because that, I mean, we would have never had got a record deal if we didn't get a following. You know, we didn't get a record deal because somebody heard our music and went, we want Hoodie and the Blowfish. We got a record deal because we sold 50,000 copies of our, of our CD out of the back of our car. And that's, you know, and I think that's really needs to happen is you need more clubs playing live music that and taking chances on bands that are traveling around. That's, that's a sentiment I hear from a lot of people around this town because after uh, uh, Cumberland's closed down, you know, downtown is missing that smaller venue. We, uh, the Music Hall and the Music Farm are both great, mm -hmm. big size venues, but we don't have that Nothing has filled that hole downtown here for that Cumberland's kind of thing. So I think incubator, right three hundred fifty to five hundred right. person yeah. place that you know absolutely that the college kids can walk to because God knows we don't need y'all getting a DUI around here. We use a, <laughs> you know, as much as I've been grateful that you come to see us at the poorhouse and then responsibly get yourselves back home. It's just t we could really use that. Okay, so what's been one of your most memorable experiences so far on your music career journey? I think the the ultimate moment for me so far was uh, 1995 when we won the Grammy for for Let Her Cry. We we had we had just won the Best New Artist and and it was cool and there was a song out called Waterfall by TLC that we thought were it was like it's a good song. It was it had seven Grammy nominations and we thought it was going to win everything and then we were up against it so we thought we have no chance. So we get off the stage and you know back back then. Uh, I'll, I'll put it this way, people would tell you, Patrick would tell you, when we were partying, there was nobody, nobody that partied harder than Hootie the Blowfish. And so we were having a party, we had just won a damn Grammy, we were having a party. And we were sitting there, and the four of us were sitting together, and everybody's dressed to the nines, and you know, we got on a Music Farm t-shirt, and our hats on, and, and they say, and it's, it's Kiss and makeup for the first time since the 70s. And one of the reasons I played music was because of Kiss. Kiss was really important to me as a kid. And, and it was Tupac Shakur, who at the time, I was just hounding these guys with his record. I played every day. And, you know, and so they get up to this podium and they, you know, they say, who do you know, Blowfish? That was, that's one of those moments I'll, ne I'll never forget that as long as I live. It's a good one. Yeah. Me neither. It actually, uh, it actually seems surreal. Like whenever I think back to that, I feel like I'm watching it. I don't feel like I lived it. I feel like I watched it happen. Yeah. It, it, I, I agree with you. Especially kiss back and makeup, because yeah. I'm a pretty tall fella, and I was looking up at Gene Simmons in those dragon boots, like, damn, yeah. is he gonna breathe fire on me? Yeah, that was amazing. And now we're managed by the same guy that managed. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Ironically, um, music world is small. All right, yeah. so carrying most memorable to this point. Oh, man, 
There have been so many things. I think for me, uh, and it's probably different for Michael, but um, it was we opened for we were opening up for Dolls last summer, and we came through the Ryman Auditorium and we played our first show at the Ryman. And I grew up in Nashville, and when we were I was a kid, that place wasn't even renovated. It was a it was a, a tourist destination. You went through. It was still very. It was before the great renovations when they started having the shows there. But they let the little kids, when we were kids, walk up and speak into the WSM microphone so we'd get a feeling of what that was like. And then to come back 30 years later after, you know, being nurtured so much by that city and then nurtured so much by this city and with my husband opening up for our friends' dolls, like my whole family there. Um, and just to add a little bit of sweetness to the, to the uh, pudding, they put us in the Johnny and June room there, like the, <laughs> over in the rhyme. And so like they're the dressing room that's full of all the Johnny and June memorabilia. And I just thought to myself, I was like, if this is, it, even if it gets better than this, it can never get better than this. This is the sweetest. <laughs> no matter what they tell you, no matter how, if money rains from the sky like manna from heaven, it will never be sweeter than this moment. And I tre I'll treasure it always. I'll never forget it. Awesome. Good question, Becky. You got some great answers there. All right, well, that's all the time we have. Uh, big hand for Darius Rucker and Carrie Ann Hurst. Thank you all.